Hi, I'm Seth Shostak, Senior Astronomer here at the SETI Institute. Welcome to Facebook Live, and today we're going to present something about a planet you probably haven't thought about for, well, at least a week, namely Neptune. Mark Showalter here is a senior planetary astronomer. He's a senior everything here at the Institute, right? Just say senior. It's just, 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 just to get that over with, yes. A exactly. And uh, anyhow, uh, Mark is a, a remarkable guy here, uh, not to make a pun there, but he has, he has found moons of Pluto. He was involved in the New Horizons mission to go to Pluto and then kept on going to Ultima, Theory, uh, Ultima Thule. It's mm -hmm. still going, right? Uh, it's never going to stop. It's well, on its way. But it's on its way to I'll somewhere. To, well, hopefully we'll have to find another target. But meanwhile, it's just going out. Okay, it's, it's just, just <laughs> coasting. All yeah. right, but we're not going to talk about uh, New Horizons today. No, not today. We're going to talk about Neptune and something uh, that you've discovered that's kind of interesting about Neptune. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so um, we've been doing a bunch of Neptune observations with the Hubble Space Telescope over uh, a number of years now. Um, back early in the spring, we announced uh, uh, the story about Hippocamp, a uh, tiny moon of Neptune that was too small to be seen by Voyager, but we found it in our Hubble images. Uh, how big is too small? Uh, so Hippocamp, oh, you're going to embarrass me. Uh, it's sort of like 20 kilometers, so, you know, 15, 20 kilometer radius. So it's be kind of like 15, 30 miles, you know, somewhere 20 okay. miles the, the, diameter kind of a thing. 30 miles diameter, okay. So a little bit bigger than Washington, D.C. Yeah, kind of peninsula, size of the San Francisco Peninsula or, okay. yeah, yeah, something like that. I'm an East Coast kind of guy. Oh, sorry. All right, yes. but it wasn't that you discovered this moon. Well, no, it was. Oh, it uh, was. Hipp the hippocamp we discovered. So oh, that, okay. was, uh, that was part of the same program. And that whole program goes back to uh, 2006 when we got it started. And we were basically looking for all the small faint things that are orbiting Neptune. There were six moons discovered by Voyager. Uh, we found the seventh, which is the one we now call Hippocamp. Uh, but we've also been tracking the others. And the story today is about uh, kind of a weird little situation we found out with some of the other moons, uh, inner moons well, of Neptune. Well, let me back up just a bit, because Neptune was found a very famous story, actually. It was found in the 19th century, I believe, uh, on the basis of uh, predictions that were made yes. by mathematicians in That's Europe, right. right? Okay, so they find the, 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 the planet, and then, of course, now people know the planet is there, and they start looking for moons. Some of the moons are big enough to have been found you know, more than 100 years ago, right? Well, Triton is certainly the exceptional one. It's uh, quite large. It's, uh, it's actually about the size of our moon. Um, it is actually probably a captured object uh, early in the history of Neptune. Uh, some object from out in the Kuiper Belt, out where Pluto lives and beyond, uh, got trapped, fell into Neptune, and got caught into orbit around Neptune. And that's the moon Triton that we see today. Okay. So that, that's a big one. You, you, you might be able to see that, what, with an 8-inch telescope here on the... No, okay. Uh, I, um, probably more than 8-inch, but it's, uh, you'd be able to see it in a reasonable size. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Neptune. But this new moon, Hippocamp, Yep. which sounds like part of my brain, uh, Hippocamp, uh, all right, 30 miles across. Mm -hmm. You found it using... The Hubble telescope. The Hubble telescope. You yes. found a lot with the Hubble telescope. Uh, yeah. You've got, you got your tax dollars back on that device. <laughs> okay, right. but there's something odd about it. Well, so uh, Hippocamp is actually not the moon we're talking about today, but Hippocamp is a, an, an interesting story in itself. It's a little piece of a bigger moon called Proteus. Proteus was discovered around the Voyager era, uh, back in 1989 or so, and uh, we actually made a pretty good case that Hippocamp, this tiny little rock, is actually the result of a big impact into Hippocamp early in the history of the Neptune system. I mean, one of the things we think about with Neptune is that uh, you probably had some kind of ring satellite system that looked kind of like maybe Saturn's or Uranus's or Jupiter, something like that, and then Tri uh, Triton came along. This big hunkin' object fell into Neptune and got caught into this orbit. It was in a wacko kind of long eccentricity, uh, sort of elliptical orbit. It just kind of completely disrupted the entire Neptune system, you know, probably in a few hundred million years into the history of the solar system. So once that happened, uh, Triton eventually settled down into a nice circular orbit that is just fine, except it's going the wrong way around Neptune. It's a retrograde moon. Uh, meanwhile, there was a moon now called Nereid that's been known for, for maybe a century or so. Uh, Nereid was probably a close-in moon of Neptune that just got tossed out into this very, very long elliptical orbit, and that's where it is today. But now there are these seven other moons that are known to exist, uh, six of which were seen by Voyager. Those are kind of the uh, Neptune system 
version two uh, probably Triton completely destroyed whatever was there originally. But once it got settled down again, the stuff that got left behind in the middle around Neptune settled down into a couple of rings um, and six, seven moons. Okay, now let me back up here a little bit because you know people see maps of the solar system. They go to the local planetarium. And, you know, they see these planets. You know, serenely orbiting the sun with the moon serenely orbiting the planets. But the facts are that in the very early days, more than right. four billion years ago, you know, this was a shooting gallery, right? It was very it was a chaotic. mess out there. In fact, uh, one of the things uh, our, our new results is about something called a resonance, and uh, that has a great important role in the history of our solar system because uh, today Jupiter and and Saturn, the two largest planets. Uh, Jupiter goes around the sun about five and a half years and Saturn about 12. But there was a time in the distant past when Saturn got into a position where it was exactly twice as long for it to go around the sun as Jupiter was. That's called a two to one resonance. And when that happened, Jupiter kind of pumped up the orbit of Saturn and Saturn got into a very elliptical orbit. Uh, there's some belief that at that time Uranus and Neptune might have swapped places. Uh, but also what happened, which is very important for us here on Earth, is uh, it triggered something called the late heavy bombardment, which is that all that stuff that was floating around in the solar system up until that time, its orbits were no longer stable and it just went flying all over the place. Uh, a, lot of that ob a lot of those objects were small comet-like objects that landed on Earth, brought us the water that is on Earth today, probably how life formed, had a lot to do with this two to one resonance that happened for a per period of time I mean, I think between that's Jupiter a, and Saturn. That's really important, Mark, because people, you know, they, they hear this stuff and they say, oh yeah, okay, that's stuff that's, I don't know, suitable for a, a, a PhD thesis for some astronomy student. But the facts are, if you go to the Pacific in the summer and go swimming, you're swimming in, you know, asteroid and comet juice yeah, it's comet because juice. of this that's situation right. from four billion years that's ago. That's exactly right. The late heavy bombardment that is called. Uh, it's also what most of the craters we see on the moon I mean, one of the reasons we know about the late heavy bombardment is when the uh, astronauts brought pieces of the moon back and tried to figure out how old they are, they were all the same age. And the reason they are all the same age is because all those craters, many of those craters happened at the same time. There was this huge amount of cratering happening, all these collisions, about four or five hundred billion years into the, or four or five hundred million years into the history of the solar system. And we here, four billion years later, are partly results of that event. But were Saturn and Jupiter at the same distance from the sun back in those early days? No, they so, uh, so they all migrate a little bit. And what happened was that Jupiter and Saturn just got into this right configuration where it became exactly two to one. And that's when Saturn went flying all over the place. Uh, well, not, I mean, you know, within, within reason. It's, it's, I, I don't want to overstate that. But it disturbed Never made it to New else. Jersey. Really. It never made it to New Jersey. But it did disturb everything else around. And that's why all these comets, asteroids that were essentially debris left over when the solar system formed out there, they might have stayed there forever, but because of this event, they fell. And a lot of them hit Earth and brought us our water and hit the moon. and. Uh, basically define much of what the inner solar system looks like today. Okay, so we probably wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for this resonant situation exactly. that developed between Jupiter and Saturn. Now, we're not talking about Jupiter and Saturn, of course. We're talking about Neptune, so continue this story. Yeah, so, uh, so it just, uh, what we were talking about just illustrates the, uh, the importance of resonances. They are certain ways that satellites or planets configure themselves. Uh, sometimes it creates great stability. There is a, a planetary system called TRAPPIST-1 that has, I believe, seven planets. Uh, and though every one of those planets is in a particular configuration with the next one. It's like this one goes around three to two. It's like a three to two, three times around versus two times around. And then the next one is maybe, I don't know, two to three, whatever. They, they keep going. Uh, so every one of these planets, and for the TRAPPIST system, that makes it very stable. Uh, the uh, result we have for Neptune also makes it very, very stable. Uh, now, what we have found, uh, there are two little moons of Neptune, and uh, maybe I'll uh, Maybe can I switch to the, uh, to the video here? Uh, you can see my screen. Uh, so um, these are the two innermost moons of Neptune. They are uh, just little specks uh, in the Voyager images, but we know they're kind of like 60 miles across, so maybe twice the size of Hippocamp now. Uh, these two moons are the in closest, and they are, um, that's really all we knew about them. One of the problems is that Niad, the smaller innermost one, uh, had never been seen since Voyager. So in 1989, we did a flyby. Niad was seen, we got a good look at it, a decent look at it, and then that's it until 
basically the work that, uh, that I've been doing uh, with these Hubble Neptune images. Were there any surprises when you, when you could actually see the surface? Yes, when we, well, well, we couldn't see the surface. It's still a dot, but it's in the wrong place. That, uh, NIAD, when we finally tracked it down, was completely off from the way we predicted it, and that's just because we had this little bit of information about its orbit in 89, and we were pushing, extrapolating that all the way forward to 2000, 2010, and we got it wrong because there were enough errors in the first measurements to give us that kind of uncertainty. We finally nailed down NIAD, and when we nailed down NIAD, we found that it's in this very, very weird resonance with Thalassa, which is the next moon out. Uh, so I've talked about Saturn and Jupiter being in a two to one, and the, we see four to three, and we see all kinds of configurations like that. Uh, uh, the Naiad to uh, Thalassa configuration is 69 to 73, which is a very weird set of numbers. Well, we maybe better explain that. I mean, yeah, yeah. one goes around, what, so, 69 times? So essentially, goes... Naiad, the innermost moon, goes around 73 times, and Thalassa goes around 69 times. And it's exactly 69, it's an integer. Exactly. It's not 69.246. Exactly, it's exactly an integer. And uh, this particular configuration makes them stable for reasons that we had never quite imagined. And uh, so it's just, for us, it's a really nice illustration of what, what kind of uh, uh, efforts the, uh, the laws of the universe will go to to make a stable configuration among, among a couple of moons of Neptune. And uh, so 69 to 73, so we're on my screen now, uh, Lee. So I'm going to just, uh, I'll hit play. Um, so this is just the way they looked in the Voyager images. And now if we uh, just wait for a minute, it'll go forward. This is a, a better sense now of Naiad and Thalassa. These are kind of to scale relative to each other. Are they really football shaped? Uh, they are football shaped. Uh, many small moons are kind of elongated like this. But now we can look at the configuration. Now what we're doing here is we are sitting on Thalassa. Uh, or just above the lasso, looking down toward Neptune, and we're watching Naiad go by. Now, the first thing you notice about Naiad, you see the sort of wobbly uh, path it's following. Naiad is on a very tilted orbit relative to Thalassa, and that's there's, it may be an interesting story there, too. We're not quite sure why it's got, to, got such a big tilt. But these moons are so close that you would expect that Thalassa and Naiad, every four days or so, would get very, very close, because Naiad's going around a little bit faster, and they should line up. And this uh, configuration, which I will now stop, is the way we have found the system, which is that uh, Thalassa, this little yellow dot in the middle that you can see here, uh, has sort of locked itself into a place such that Naiad never gets very close. The idea with a lot of resonance is that they configure themselves in just the perfect way so that moons never get too close to each other because then they're more stable. When they get too close, they're big effects and you don't kind of want that to happen. So we've gotten uh, Nyad into this configuration where it sort of goes by once, it goes north of, Mas of Thalassa, and then it goes by the next time north, and then it goes by the next time south, and then the next time after that, it goes south again. And well, every four times, every four times they line up, it repeats and it creates this ropey, uh, ropey structure. But right there in the middle, in that safest of all possible places, is where we found Thalassa. And I gotta ask, I mean, is that because it's sort of forced into this position, or is it selected to be in this position? I mean, when I think of the trees in the forest, right, they're dropping, I don't know, cones or acorns or everywhere, right? And, but the trees that try to grow right next to the mother tree, if you will, and they don't make it because the mother tree shades them out right. of existence. So the trees are sort of naturally spaced, you know, I don't know, a few yards apart or whatever they are, mm -hmm. right? So that's just, they're selected to do that. Well, yes. Is that what's happened here? So or are there me mechanisms that sort of force them into this situation? So it's a, it's a combination of both. They can't be too close or they would never have been stable. But, when the, but to get uh, to this point of stability, rather than sort of, there's a migration also that goes on long over the history of these moons so that uh, they are not, so maybe they start not in resonance and then they kind of reach that state. And if it's stable, they'll stay there. Um, or if it's not, they'll, they'll leave the resonance. What's going on here is if uh, Nyad has this big orbital tilt, and what's interesting is that we think of all these moons in a plane. So if you're sitting on Thalassa, and you're looking at Neptune, and you expect Nyad to come by in, the, in between, it's never there. It's basically up above you, about 45 degrees up or 45 degrees down. It is never in line. And that's the way that it can, is stable, because it means that they never get too close. It's always way up or way down. I'd just like to remind the viewers 
uh, that uh, if this story resonates with you, you <laughs> might you might want to uh, ask a question of Mark here. We're taking your questions, and Jasmine, who's in the back, uh, transcribing them from the original Hungarian, will bring them up to us, and, and and Mark will take them on. So don't hesitate to provide that kind of feedback. Right. So. All right, so th this is a new result. Yeah, so uh, it's just, it's, uh, it's an illustration of the lengths to which moons will go to to find that sort of special stable place, and once they get there, they will stay there. I mean, the story here uh, is just kind of fun. My, the lead author in this work is, uh, is named uh, Marina Brozovic. She works at uh, JPL, and we were discussing this. We were working on the data. We were both trying to figure out these orbits, and we were both looking for resonances anywhere in the Neptune system, and I didn't find any. And then she said, well, I found this one, but it's 69 to 73. <laughs> I said, you've got to be kidding. That's ridiculous. It sounds like a football score. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. And, uh, and then we uh, finally um, talked about it some more. We thought about what it means. And we realized that it was really just this very elegant solution to a problem that we didn't know Knight and Thalassa had. They are so close that they had to figure out some way to live together uh, you know, it's kind of like your family, you like them around, but maybe not too close too often, and that's kind of the way uh, you get stability when you just don't have too, too much close contact. All right, I'd like to generalize this <laughs> behavior to other parts of the solar system and even the cosmos, but uh, Jasmine points out that there are people watching you here mm -hmm. uh, in Australia, in Sydney, which is near the larger city of Penrith, uh, Canada, Pensacola, Florida, Provence, France, Wichita. Oh, man. Wichita, they have cows on the sidewalks. Finland, oh, come Minnesota. On. <laughs> no, I mean, but they're concrete cows. Oh, maybe so. Okay, yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah. I, 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 they may have real cows. I mean, I don't know. I, that was okay. <laughs> you have a beef with that? Finland, Minnesota, Portugal. All right, but submit your questions. Is it not true that the big moons of Jupiter, you know, the ones yes. that Galileo found in 1609, whatever? that they're also in a resonance. Yes, that was a discovery by uh, Pierre Laplace, uh, 1700s, I believe, uh, that uh, Io, Europa, and Ganymede, the th first three of the four large moons of Jupiter, are in what's now called the Laplace resonance. Essentially, Io goes around four times, and Europa goes around twice, and, uh, and uh, uh, Callisto. Not Callisto, thank you, goes around once. So four to two to one, it's a two to one ratio and another two to one ratio, and that is a very, very stable resonance. But there's an interesting thing about it. The way that all works out, Io, Europa, and Ganymede, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, yes, Io, Europa, and Ganymede can never be in a line. Because if two of them are crossing each other, then the other one's on the other side of Jupiter. That is the magic that these, uh, this con particular configuration has that means the moons never get all that close to each other. And, uh, you know, so one of the things I always remember about the great movie 2001, uh, which had uh, the, the spacecraft going out to Jupiter for the first time, and they were showing, you know, illustrating that something really important was happening, they showed the four moons all lined up. That can't happen. So, you know, Arthur C. Clarke actually knew that, but he, they may put it in the story anyway. But the, uh, the moons of Jupiter are designed so that they can never get too close to each other. Now, you should talk to Stanley Kubrick, not to Arthur C. Clarke. Exactly. I mean, you can talk yes. to either one of them about with equal effectiveness. With equal effectiveness, these, yes. <laughs> but, but that resonance, is it not important? I mean, Europa is of interest for those looking for life in the solar system because it has this, you know, thin shell and there's this big ocean. But, you know, occasionally it shoots some of the water out through cracks. And mm -hmm. is that related to the resonance it has with the other moons? I suspect so. More, a much a better illustration of that is with Io. Io is the closest one, and it is really pumped in and out because of this particular resonance. Um, Io has volcanoes. The reason it has volcanoes is that it's being kind of tightly squeezed as it goes in and out from Jupiter. It gets a little flexed, and that creates heat inside, and all volcanic activity on Io is the result of this resonance. If not for the fact that it was being continually pushed around by Europa and Ganymede, the next two out, it would have settled down into a nice, happy circular orbit millennia, you know, uh, billions of years ago, and there'd be no, it would be a solid, frozen ball of ice, basically, and uh, there'd be no volcanoes at all. But because it's being pumped by these other two moons in this resonant configuration, that's how you get its heat source, that's how you get it to be uh, volcanic. Now, I suspect the same thing is going on with Europa, where it's pumped, but not quite the way Io is, but it still get that kind of flexing that's gonna keep the liquid water inside. People ask all the time, when are we gonna find life in space? And one easy possibility, maybe it's not so easy, 
from somebody sitting behind a desk, it's easy, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to send a spacecraft uh, to the vicinity of Europa and grab some of that stuff being squeezed out of its liquid center mm -hmm. and bring that back to Earth and look under a microscope at it, and maybe there's some life there. And if that works, and if it happens, you know, you could thank resonance for that, too. You could. I had no appreciation. All right, here we go. Also, the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah, or Troutdale, Oregon, uh, Oregon. Uh, Spain, Texas. Texas is its own uh, country, I suppose. Tennessee, Slovenia, uh, uh, no, Anfield, Liverpool, Romania. Okay, here's a question from Ron, who asks, does Neptune have a magnetic field, and how does that affect its moon's orbits? So it does have a very strong magnetic, magnetic field. Um, actually, Uranus and Neptune have very, very strange, very interesting magnetic fields. Um, and uh, in the case of uh, Neptune, however, uh, that affects the way charged particles move around. It affects the way dust particles move around. So when we study the rings of Neptune, we're very interested in the magnetic field because it's kind of cockeyed and offset. And so uh, if you're a dust particle with a little bit of electric charge, you get pumped up and down by the uh, magnetic field. For something as big as uh, Night or Thalassa, the magnetic field isn't a very big, doesn't play a very big role. But it does play a role in the rest of the system. And so it is a very important thing for us to study. I should also just note that uh, NASA is finally uh, getting very interested in sending another spacecraft out to Uranus or Neptune, or maybe even one of each, uh, because we have not been to these objects except for a quick flyby with Voyager uh, in 86 for Uranus and 89 for, for Neptune. There is so much we don't know about these bodies. And one of the things that you really can't observe until you get up close is the magnetic field. So yep. we would learn a whole lot more uh, with, uh, with a new spacecraft to either of those planets. Now, you know, it's maybe worth pointing out that Neptune and Uranus are planets that are, you know, they're bigger than the Earth, but they're smaller than Saturn or Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And so these sort of intermediate-sized planets turn out to be, I, I guess you could call it a super-Earth, or maybe you wouldn't call it a super-Earth, but it's, it's a planetary size. We don't have really, uh, well, we find a lot of them in, in, in yes. the cosmos, let me put it that way. Yeah, I think uh, one of the reasons we're getting... Well, we've always, I've always been interested in Neptune, but, you know, NASA has yeah, that other priority. exceptional, Mark. I mean. <laughs> um, the, uh, one of the reasons it's so important, people are recognizing scientifically, to go back to what we call the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, is that they are a lot like the exoplanets in terms of size and amount of heat they get, temperature, and so on. Uh, they are a lot like the exoplanets we are finding around other stars. And, and by the way, uh, what Ron had asked is, does the magnetic field affect the moon's orbits? Yeah, so uh, moons really don't get affected by magnetic fields just because they're big. But all the stuff around them, uh, which includes things like the, those weak, weak uh, atmospheres around all these bodies, just kind of stuff floating away, uh, the magnetic field plays a huge role in all of that. You mentioned that Neptune has a ring. Yes, now, uh, many people, Yeah, many. Uh, but you may have been involved with that. Is it, that's something you discovered, right? Well, um, I didn't, it's an interesting old story that uh, I was actually working at the Neptune flyby way back in 1989. I was a postdoc, and uh, I was uh, doing the night shift as we were uh, getting those images down for the first time. And we had already suspected that there were uh, some kind of ring arcs or something around Neptune. That had been detected from Earth uh, by uh, seeing a star blink out when... Uh, when it, in addition to Neptune, passed in front of the star. Uh, so I was actually working the night shift on the night that this image came down, like showed arcs, like three little, and I was like, oh my god. And uh, so I had to call some of the team, team members and wake them up in the middle of the night. It was like three in the morning. I had to wake them up and say, uh, uh, hey. Give them a ring, as it were. I give them a ring and say, uh, hey, we got something here. You might want to come in. Uh, remember, remember one of the uh, science, uh, science team members came in uh, by maybe about four in the morning. And he said he brought in a bottle of champagne. And he said, Mark, this is either to celebrate with you if we've, in fact, discovered the rings of Neptune, or else it's to beat you over the head if we haven't. Uh, but we did. And, uh, and, and that is recorded, I believe that was in the front page of the New York Times. There was a story about the discovery of the rings of Neptune that said, a technician was working that night when such and such happened. And well, you're the, I was that technician. You're the guy. And I take great pride in that. <laughs> but I, have no, I don't claim I'm the discoverer in any way of the rings of Neptune. I was a cog in a machine that was way bigger than myself. A technician in the machine. I mean, just to recap, Mm -hmm. Obviously, people know that Saturn has rings, Neptune has rings. Yes. You want to tell us the other bodies in our solar system that are they, ringed? Every, uh, well, the giant.
giant planets, all four of the giant planets. Jupiter has a very faint dusty ring system uh, that was also discovered during the Voyager flybys. Uh, and, uh, and Uranus has, uh, uh, I don't know how you would count them exactly, we usually designate them as 10 inner dense rings. Uh, that were discovered around and before the time of the Voyager flyby, and then two much fainter outer rings that we discovered back in 2006 uh, using the Hubble telescope again, using doing work similar to what we've been doing for Neptune recently. You look for rings in, around Pluto, right? Oh, and then we looked for rings around Pluto. We did not find any rings around Pluto, and but uh, and not, I won't say accidentally, we were actually looking for moons too, and that was how we discovered Kerberos. Uh, and then uh, a year later, Styx, uh, both uh, the two smallest moons of Pluto, uh, both again discovered using the Hubble telescope. I don't want you to be hassled on the freeway, but I noticed that your license plate says S Pan, I think it is. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, that, that's, I've had that since about 1990, uh, shortly after 1990. And after that's a uh, moon. Pan is the innermost moon of Saturn. Uh, that was a discovery based on Voyager images uh, that uh, the flybys of Saturn were in 80 and 81. Uh, but doing a whole bunch of work with uh, me and some colleagues over the years trying to figure out one of the gaps in the rings of Saturn, we realized that there had to be a moon in there, there had to be a certain size, it had to be on a certain orbit, and then putting that information all together in 1990, which is, of course, 10 years after the flyby, uh, was when we discovered Pan. So that was my first, my first moon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, okay. Well, actually, <laughs> this business about the rings leads into this question from Neil. Neil doesn't tell us where he is. He's probably in the witness protection program. Uh, his question is, did, it, did the braided F ring of Saturn. Oh, gosh. Yeah, well. No, it's a good question. Go, well, I've finished finish. the question. Yeah. You, if you can answer it already, you know, you, you get the all expense paid vacation to <laughs> the La Jolla or something. Did the braided F ring of Saturn afford any clue as to how complex these orbits can be? So, uh, well. The I mean, that's a very informed question. Yeah, I think. Let, me, let me fill this up. <laughs> Maybe not everybody is conversant no. on the effering of Saturn. It happens to be one of my favorite topics. So, so thank you, Neil, for, for bringing it up. Um, this is a, a faint ring outside the main rings of Saturn. It was uh, detected during the Pioneer 11 flyby of Saturn. Oh, so what year is that? It's, uh, oh, it's about 80, 79, something like that. And, uh, but then seen very well by Voyager. It is um, a narrow ring, but it's got this kind of weird uh, sort of radial patterns. When we saw them in the Voyager images, uh, it's, it looked kind of braided, and uh, so um, that was, it's always been known as the braided ring. Uh, we got a whole lot of data about the F ring in the Cassini mission. The Cassini mission orbited Saturn from 2004 to 2017. When, when you say braided, that means if you look at it, it you looks see like it has little strands that kind of, you know, weave in and out. They don't actually, it's not braided in any kind of literal sense, but uh, it looks like that. And uh, we've kind of learned based on a whole lot of Cassini data and a whole lot of work that a number of scientists have uh, have put effort into understanding the F ring of Saturn based on the much higher quality and much larger body of data we have from Cassini. Uh, it's basically got a couple of satellites around it or little bodies that kind of collide with it and uh, it tends to form these little strands and things that are kind of transitory, but they show up. Uh, there was one period in the Voyager mission, or I'm sorry, in the Cassini mission when suddenly a little piece of the uh, F ring got like hundred times brighter than it had been. And over the years, this sort of like spread and kind of faded out. But it was just like, so there was some big impact into the F ring as we were watching it, creating the kinds of things that look in the old Voyager data, like, you know, braids and strands and things. It was that kind of thing that was been going on, uh, probably going on all the time. But we really only had a snapshot at Voyager. We got a much better picture with Cassini. Well, we're getting to the end here. Wait a minute, I, another, another question uh, from Manuel. Can you prove or disprove the existence of life on Europa, in Europa, by analyzing the water vapor from orbit? In other words, you know, could, could you prove life exists on Europa without actually landing on Europa? Well, so um, let me make some, maybe. I would never say you can't. I would never ever say that. Uh, I think a better case might be with Enceladus, which is a, moon, a somewhat smaller moon at Saturn, uh, that showed these massive geysers when uh, Cassini got there and got the very best images. And uh, it's clearly got some big cracks in its uh, near its south pole, uh, big slits with stuff flying out of it all the time. Uh, so that is a place where basically the innards of 
this icy moon is an ice shell with water on the inside, and that water is being squeezed out, in effect, by the flexing of, of, of Enceladus, and then it shoots out through these slits, goes into the uh, goes into outside, and that's when it instantly freezes. And uh, so Europa is probably a similar kind of phenomenon. We have not. We don't have great images yet or great understanding of what kind of plumes there are on Europa, but it's probably a similar phenomenon, ice, uh, ice shell, water inside being squeezed out. It would be possible conceivably if there were life in there that we could just basically scoop it up with a spacecraft, bring it home or analyze it there and find out, you know, see microbes, see little, you know, bacteria or something. I, I, I might that um, not be I'm not going to say that you, that's impossible at all. Um, the, um, what I would say is that so, you could potentially prove that there is life in Europa or Enceladus by just sweeping this stuff up. Okay, but if you were running NASA, would you say, okay, I've only got a finite amount of money to spend in the search for life, and I can continue doing my reconnaissance of Mars, or I could send a spacecraft to scoop up some stuff around Enceladus. Well, where, where would you put the money? So that's a, that's a, that's a great question. That's a question that NASA and a lot of scientists are discussing now. In fact, there is a spacecraft that is um, being built. It's called Europa Clipper, and it is going to Europa. And it, it will not be in orbit of Europa, but it will be a mapping mission. It will fly by Europa a lot from different ways. Uh, it will be exploring, among other things, what are the places where we might drop a lander on Europa, something like that. Um, and, you know, so it's a step toward the process of seeing if there are, you know, microbes or maybe even whales swimming around inside of, of Europa. Uh, there have been proposed... Is there any food for a whale down there? <laughs> well, maybe whales is pushing it, but, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, in the case of Enceladus, there are certainly proposals and plans on the books for a way that you could fly a spacecraft to Enceladus and do the same kind of sampling uh, for the potential detection of life. But uh, that's not been approved. But the Europa mission is actually in the works. It's going to fly. Uh, I think it gets there in early 2030s. So you'll have to be a little patient. Take 2030s. To... I'll, I'll be careful in driving. Yes. Well, we've come to the end of this, but I want to ask you one more question. And that's this. And it's based on something I read this morning about uh, 2i Borshoff, which is this you know, new comet that is oh, yes. it's just yes. going around the sun now. You know, it's in our solar system, but it came from somebody else's solar right. system. And, you know, to the extent that it's possible to do so at the great distance this thing is, it's like 200 million miles away, whatever. You know, it looks like comets from our own solar system, mm -hmm. which suggests that solar systems share a lot in common. Do you figure there's a Mark Showalter <laughs> in some uh, other planetary system saying, hey, I just found this really interesting resonance in our solar system. I mean, you know, is, is this something that's, in fact, what you're finding are, are really, if you will, laws of the universe. Oh. So absolutely, I mean, resonances are everywhere. I mean, not just in our solar system, we've seen them in the TRAPPIST-1 case. So we've actually seen a whole bunch of planets in this perfect configuration of uh, resonance by resonance by resonance. Uh, so that's happening everywhere. So if there is an a extraterrestrial dynamicist who is studying their own planetary system, they're saying, wow, look at this. There are all these mathematical relationships between the bodies in my solar system and maybe they're out there as well. And they may have seen it TRAPPIST-1 and they may have that confirmation. If they saw our solar system, we don't have any planet resonances that they would get a good look at. But, you know, uh, resonances are everywhere. That is clear. And they are a big part of understanding how our solar systems form and how, our, how all the satellites and planets themselves form. It's good to know that if you move to another solar system, you don't have to take physics again. That's right. Same physics everywhere. That's the no always a good thing to know. Yes. <laughs> Mark Showalter, <laughs> thanks so very much. And thanks to you for watching uh, Facebook Live. We'll be back here next week with a as yet unannounced uh, subject matter. It's always so interesting that we don't want to, you know, give it away in advance. I'm Seth Shostak. He's Mark Showalter. We'll see you next thanks time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>